How did Jesus tell us to treat sinning Christians? Did, did he have anything to say about it? Well, the first one is his example. Uh, John chapter uh, 8, verses 10 and 11. And this is, this is a fascinating account. In fact, Peter Marshall wrote one of the most beautiful, uh, he used to be the chaplain of the Senate, he wrote one of the most beautiful accounts, um, you know, expanding on, on this event. You remember the story about the woman taking adultery, dragged, plopped in front of Jesus. Jesus is teaching in Solomon's portico in the temple, and they plop her there, and they say, you know, uh, she needs to be stoned. And so Jesus started writing. And actually, the word says um, that he wrote, uh, verse 6, he, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And the, the Greek word is kata grafe. Grafe means to write. Kata means toward. And so Jesus was writing on the ground. If you can just imagine this, here are all the accusers standing around, and here's Jesus. And these accusers, I mean, they've plopped the poor woman right in front of Jesus. And so Jesus stooped on the ground, and toward this person, he wrote something on the ground right here. Then he turned, and he wrote something toward this one. And then he wrote and wrote something, katagraphe, katagraphe, toward each of them, and never said anything. And you know what happened? The stones thudded to the ground. Do you know what he did? He looked right at them, and, and he knew their besetting sins. And he wrote on the ground, most commentators say that he wrote the commandment of their secret sin. Liar. Maybe one was an adulterer. Maybe one had hatred like he was a murderer. Maybe one was covetous. And Jesus wrote toward them their sin. And you remember what happened. They all left. And so this is what happened. When Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, verse 10, he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? Verse 11, she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You notice the, the two parts. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus didn't condemn. But look at this. You see, there's this idea of what they call free grace. That grace means you can, uh, you're free from the law, O oh, blessed condition, sin all I want with Jesus' permission is the song that goes with that. No, no, no. Jesus said grace never condemns because he has justified us but justification is not real if it's not attached to sanctification. And sanctification is to repent. And you, you say, how often? As often as needed. See, it doesn't mean like you just say, oh, I'm never going to do that again, and you're set for life. It's, it's as often as we slip back, we have to say no. And Jesus said, go and sin no more. Go and, and don't have an unbroken pattern of sin. Have it broken by repeated repentance. So what is Christ, uh, te his teaching about how to treat a sinning Christian? Uh, you are to not condemn them. They're to be uncondemned, but constantly challenged to leave their life of sin. And if they won't leave their life of sin, then we already know. The default setting is what we already have seen. Uh, second principle, not only are we supposed to, in an uncondemnedly way, approach them about their sin. James 5, if you want to turn there, remember James is the very first New Testament epistle that was written. It was written in the 40s. It's the snapshot of what the earliest form of the church was like. If you want to see the, the church of the book of Acts in action, it's in the book of James. How do we know that? Because James was the pastor that's in Acts 15. And, and he's the one that wrote this epistle. And he also was Jesus Christ's earthly brother. And in fact, Jesus had two brothers that wrote books, and, and we're going to see both of them. Here's the other one right here. These, these two were great early church leaders. And what James, the brother, earthly brother of our Lord, said is, when you confront a, a sinning Christian, not only like Christ, don't condemn them, but challenge them, and, and don't let them persist in, in their sin without any challenge. But secondly, come humbly. And, and what James said 
is this, verse 19, brethren, if any one of you uh, wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. What he's saying is that, that, that any among you, it's not like, like we're above this, wanders from the truth. It's so easy to wander from the truth. So we humbly acknowledge, in fact, another verse that goes with this is in Galatians 6. And Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. There's a humility about confronting something, someone about their sin. We don't do it from standing on a platform 20 feet above them and say, stop that. We come to them like this, humbly, saying, you know, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to myself drift into this myself. I humbly come to you and say you have wandered from the truth and, and you need to be turned from the error of your way and the Lord will cover a multitude of sins. So there's a very humble attitude. Here's the last one. Look at Jude. So if you're in James, uh, go through Peter's epistles and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the little postcard just for the book of Revelation has, has one of the most beautiful words about how we're supposed to deal with sinning. In fact, it has two beautiful words. Uh, and some have compassion, that's the first word, making a distinction, but others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire. I'll always remember uh, when I, my first, second, third pastorate, but my first senior pastorate, I remember going into this parsonage and we got in this 165 year old beautiful mansion, two acres manicured and everything built by the DuPont family for the pastor of the church. It was really a beautiful old place. And they had the most beautiful New England hardwood floors. And Bonnie and I walked in and all of a sudden I said, oh, what happened there? And there was this big dark spot right in the middle of the living room. And it, it was not finished. Everything else was finished and it looked just like a Martha Stewart house. You know, it was just the most beautiful. And I said, what happened? Did the guy forget to finish that part? And the head of the trustees said, no. He said, I wouldn't let him finish that part. He said, that circle is where I knelt and came back to Christ. He said, the pastor, 20, 30 years ago, had compassion on me. He says, I was in the church, but I kept getting drunk. He said, I came from alcoholism. He says, I came to Christ and was gloriously saved, but he said, I just would wander back and go back to the old life. And he said, he came and finally one day walked right in the bar, grabbed me, pulled me off the stool and said, you need to get right with the Lord. And he said, he brought me to that spot in the parsonage. And he said, he pulled me out of the fire. He hated even my garment defiled by the flesh. But he said, his compassion and the prayers of the church, he said, made that mark that I'll never forget because he said, that's where I came back to the Lord. So how does Jesus teach us to treat sinning Christians? Not condemning them, challenge them to leave their life of sin. By the way, if they don't, the Lord will chasten them. Come humbly, knowing that any one of us, as Galatians 6, could be similarly tempted and show compassion. We don't, we don't ostracize and shun people without them knowing why, without them having repeated attempts as, as, as we saw up here, all these steps. It's a long process and anybody that gets put out of the church knows why. And they know that they were approached by people that don't condemn them, that called them to leave a life of sin, that humbly approached them, acknowledging that they are equally temptable and did it with compassion. And that's how Jesus said that we are to approach them. <laughs>